Well, folks, welcome to one more edition of Politics and Ranamik. Berto is your host. Thank you so kindly for being a part of the show. We're going to have a great show for you today again. Today we have a great, great guest. Uh, he's going to be talking about universal health care. Of course, it's not the kind that I always preach for. But, you know, when you're in this domain, what you want to do is listen. You can learn a few things. You can try to get over a few things. You can try to get people involved in a few things. Nobody has all the answers. So, you know what? I wanted to listen. I had him on before, and he said that he had some other information that he wanted to put out. This is a great guy. Bruce Pollard and Susan. How are you doing, my dear friends here in Kingwood? Bruce Davey, my brother from Portland, Oregon. Great. Thank you for being here, my friend. And uh, let's see. I know I saw Michael Rudnan in, in, in the screen elsewhere. You know, that's where... Our link provider, our researcher. Anyhow, folks, we're going to have a great show for you today. Before I get into the show, as far as what I, I want to do specifically, I want to play over something that I did yesterday because I cleaned it up a bit to take out some of the extraneous stuff. But I want this message to hit people and I want people to feel empowered by this message. But before I get started, if you are just joined in us, please remember to share, share, share. That is how we get Norman Reynolds. Welcome aboard, my brother. Listen, we need to get these things shared. We need to empower folks. So if you are on, share it. I mean, you, even if you even if you don't want folks to know you're associated with that great, that little pinko liberal or whatever, uh, you just can say, hey, check this out. So please go ahead and share. We need to get the message out. We need to get the message out. We need to empower folks because folks think, especially now that we are going into a depression and make no mistake about it. Remember the show that we spoke about, the depression will not be televised. It won't be. Because even as we're in a depression, even if some of your families that you're going to see are doing pretty bad, or maybe you, nobody's going to show it on TV. Nobody's going to want that uprising. Nobody's going to see it. So I want you guys to get ready for what's good. Look, people talk about in the socialist countries or the communist countries or the pinko third world countries, the places that I'm originally from, oh, we hide things from the population and the population doesn't know what's going on. Let me tell you, I've been in the United States for quite a few decades now. And the best, the best country that has organized hiding from its population is this country because it is, in, it is deep within the culture, within the media, all play, between the schools, all done via whom again? El Powell Manifesto. El Powell Manifesto. So folks, please do remember to share. We need you to share. Anyhow, the first video is going to be a little clip that I cleaned up and then we'll take it on the other side. Chuck Todd came on and started to talk about some stuff that Chris Christie was seeing. I guess I missed it when it happened last night or this morning. I want you guys to understand what's going on here. This is the battle that we ought to fight. We hear a lot about the right talking about the value and the sanctity of life. I want you to listen to this. We'll take it back on the other side. Let me ask you a larger philosophical question. Former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie seemed to say, imply yesterday in an interview that maybe we as Americans, we're gonna have to get used to death for a while. We have to stand up for the American way of life. Of course everybody wants to save every life they can. But the question is, towards what end ultimately? Are there ways that we can thread the middle here to allow there, that there are gonna be deaths and they're gonna be deaths no matter what. And if we can do things to keep people in the mode of wearing masks, of wearing gloves, of, of you know distancing where appropriate, we've gotta let some of these folks get back to work because if we don't, um, we're gonna destroy the American way of life in these families and it will be years and years before we can recover. Is that where we're headed? We just have to get used to a higher death toll for a while? I don't know what Governor Christie's thinking when he says that. Reminds me of some of what we heard from the Lieutenant Governor of Texas uh, seeming to almost uh, explain away that people are gonna die and cause, and, you know, treating that like a cost of doing business. I think that's unconscionable. We need to save every life we can save. And that's an American value and that's what 
with all the people who are being celebrated, the health care workers, the, the paramedics, the EMTs, they're being celebrated because they went out and saved lives no matter what. So I think the national goal should be to have the strongest possible health care system to actually address the disparities that have been laid bare and make our health care system better, more universal, to save every life. That is consistent with our values. It does not have to be inconsistent with an economic recovery. And I get very worried, Chuck, when I hear folks putting the almighty dollar on a pedestal above saving human life. I, I don't think that's consistent with what the vast majority of Americans believe. It is amazing how the right, they are selective when they're considering the value of life. Chris Christie was about to make a mistake. He said, we have to let some of these people go back to work. He was about to say, we to, to save our economy, to save the American way of life, we're going to have to make some of these people die. That is what he was really about to say, and that was clear. Here's the thing. We can sit down there and start talking about, well, you know, uh, not most people live, most people don't die. The problem is is we don't know who dies what does it say about a society when to save a particular economic system you are willing to have people die that does not have to be we don't have a system that is designed for people in other words we don't design people to fit an economic system we define an economic system to fit people i want you to get that in your heads and please brothers and sisters understand the humanity in what i am saying here you want to have an economic system designed with humanity in mind. In other words, after we decide what is the value of life, around that value of life, we build an economic system that fits that. You don't build an economic system that says X amount of people will survive. You don't build an economic system that transfers the wealth to the top, which is exactly what we're doing. Check this out. The first thing people ask is how is that policy going to affect business? That's the wrong question. The question should always be how is this policy going to affect humanity? And then how do we adjust business to fit humanity. Now, I have a question for Mike Cisek. Mike Cisek says, when I ask everybody to share, Mike Cisek, I had a very a funny comment, right? I love Mike Cisek. Mike Cisek is my foreman brother from the Midwest. And uh, one of the people that I'm also fighting very hard for with everything that I do, Mike Cisek. You know, I love you, brother. Um, look, he says, the only reason I'd share this is to provide people a laugh at the insanity here. So I'm asking you, Mr. Cisak, Brother Mike Cisak, please go ahead and share it to give those people who would think this is insanity a laugh. I bet a lot of them will think a bit more than it being just a laugh. And another thing, Mike Cisak, I'd love to have you here. I know I'm planting seeds in your mind. I know you think I'm not. But you stay here and you stay with us because... You loved here and we want to ha continue hanging out with you because, you know, we're going to get you in the long run. Anyhow, folks, um, before I forget, this morning I interviewed uh, Representative Elijah Cummins' uh, wife. You know, Elijah Cummins was the uh, chairman of the Judiciary Committee. He was really one of the powerhouses in Congress. Well, his wife is now running for MD7 in Maryland and... Uh, I interviewed her this morning. All of our subscribers will get a chance to see that before we air it. I think we're going to air it early next week, or I don't know, maybe, I'm not sure when we're going to air it live, but uh, anyone who wants that sneak preview, if you're a member, that, that's sort of an enticement, right? Uh, all, all, our, all our subscribers can get first dibs at all those kind of things, trying to find a way to increase the subscriber base so if you're interested in listening to elijah cummins representative elijah the late representative elijah cummins wife interview solid interview the woman is was on fire just uh check it out anyhow um uh steve schmidt anybody remember who steve schmidt is he used to be i think one of the writers and uh, uh republican agents for bush and cheney well, he turned on the Republican Party. I, I, I won't call him a Democrat, but he turned on the Republican Party. And he's one of the biggest critics of Donald Trump. And I'd like my conservative viewers right now to listen to this. Brother CSAC, Brother Lido, and all of you guys that are out here that are my regulars. And by the way, bring me some more conservatives in here into the room. We like speaking to everybody. Uh, but this guy has is, is probably qualitative the best... Uh, the best critic of Donald Trump on factual bases. So let's go ahead and take a listen to that, and then we'll take it on the other side. 
Steve Smith for a long time has been really hitting Donald Trump pretty hard. But today beat them all. He appeared on the 11th hour. And my God, I went ahead and fused three of his responses into one because they perfect fit sequentially. Check this out. He defined the president perfectly. His leadership has been profoundly deficient is somebody who ran for president promising to make America great again. And his legacy will be one of death, suffering, and economic collapse. And the scenes that we're seeing play out all over the country did not have to be. Job of the president is to protect the country. Donald Trump has been completely derelict in his duty. The Chinese played him for a fool. A dozen times he said that the Chinese were doing a tremendous job at this, that this would disappear overnight, that there were 15 cases here, but soon there would be zero and we're cruising towards 100,000 dead Americans and we see the moral incapacity of this president to grieve with the country to understand the level of suffering and when we look at the economy I think it's important to understand the economy did not collapse because of the coronavirus and it has not collapsed in other countries around the world it, it collapsed because of the ineptitude of the governmental response to it and he's making it worse not better and I think that uh, Donald Trump can't spin his way out of reality which is that he's the most inept president in a crisis this nation's ever had. That's why he looks so small next to Abraham Lincoln in the temple that we erected to honor the memory of the man who saved the Union. It just shows the weakness, the profound weakness of Donald Trump as a leader, as a man, to sit there in the shadow of Abraham Lincoln, who was martyred, really on the anniversary of the day that Lincoln was laid to rest in Springfield, sitting there at the feet of the greatest president, uh, our American martyr, between between on the walls that are opposed, the Gettysburg Address and the second, the second inaugural that talks about charity for all and malice towards none. He possesses literally every quality that Lincoln stood opposed to. The qualities of Lincoln's greatness, literally Donald Trump shares none of them. He has a lack of empathy, a lack of humility, a lack of vision, a lack of competence. He's been the worst president in the history of the country facing a crisis. Ironically, the worst president until now was the man who preceded Abraham Lincoln, the 15th President Buchanan. I guess he's smiling up there looking down, gratified he's not the worst president in American history anymore. Nobody blames Donald Trump for there being a coronavirus, a novel coronavirus. I think what's fair to blame Donald Trump for is the lack of preparedness by the federal government, the lack of vital equipment, the lack of testing to this day. We have the president of the United States on a stage from the White House advising the American people to shoot up Lysol. It's an absurdity. These news conferences every day, we have a president of the United States talking to the country in one of the great crises in the history of the country comparing his ratings to the bachelor finale at every conceivable level he has shown himself unfit for this moment and the challenge for the country as we look ahead to the presidential election the recovery from this event which is one of the most epic in the country's history will take many, many years. We're likely to see unemployment rates of 30%. And what he's demonstrated is a complete incapacity for leadership over and over and over again, whether it's the dishonesty, whether it's the happy talk, whether it's the partisan attacks. At every moment when he was called to be bigger, when he was called to be great, he was small. And therefore, greatness in a moment where the country required it and needed it has eluded him. And what the country has been saddled with is a level of ineptitude and incompetence that makes our allies tremble and our adversaries cheer. Wow. That's all I could say after listening to that. Wow. Because that was a complete and entire encapsulation of who Donald Trump is. And anybody has a doubt about that, just read the record. Just read the record that there are so many people out there. Yes, that is exactly right, AVQ. Damn. <laughs> AVQ on YouTube says, damn. You know, I mean, I thought last night as I watched it, you know, there were three, there were two quest three questions. And the funny thing about it is how he was able to interspace the entire narrative that he wanted to get out there. 
with three questions that did not necessarily do that. No, sir, the record is clear. It is amazing. But you know what? Those who follow Donald Trump till the end, you know what happens with the Pied Piper. But anyhow, um, what we're going to go do now is talk about what the show is today. So the title of the show today is, Does Ed Arcorn Have a Better Option Than Medicare for All? Economy and more we'll talk about. Ed Arcorn, author of Healing American Healthcare, is with us to discuss his counter to Medicare for All. We continue our discussion of demands for fully op- reopening America. Ed Icorn has another option for Medicare for All. Ed Icorn says he is a compassionate capitalist. He really does want to give everyone affordable health care. But because, as he states, he is a capitalist, he sees all solutions that are weighted towards the options that that economic system affords his thinking process. I enjoyed this interview because two people who know how to conduct a civil discussion can disagree sometimes change opinion, and still genuinely like one another. I wish we could all get there. It is like all my beautiful people in this room right now, right? Mike Cisak gives me hell every day. Daniel Leto gives me hell every day. And there is not a thread of animosity, I feel, to you guys. Because you keep me sharp. And you also teach me what's going on in that domain Because just talking to the choir is never good. Talking to everyone is what's good. And you're going to see a little thing that uh, later on that we're coming out with. um, Put uh, put the brick. Put your brick is another program we're working on with a friend of mine, a new friend of mine who was under the regime of... uh, uh, under the regime of Hugo Chavez, he's completely against Hugo Chavez, and you guys know I have, a, I have a few good feelings for leftists. I'm not talking about the bad parts of leftists, or or the bad parts of rightists, or the bad parts of, a, but those people who really have the concept of helping people is what I believe in. I would take my shirt off and give it to anybody because I think, and this has nothing to do with religion, because I'm a humanist. I think we have to learn how to genuinely care, not here, but here. And by the way, here is also here, right? Because the the thing that control here is really up here as well. But you know what I mean. I think we have to learn. I think we have to teach ourselves. Like, uh, when you know, it is easy when you disagree with somebody to hate that person, right? Because they disagree with you. But if you and your kid disagree, you never hate your kid. There's that, there's that firewall in you that you and your kid disagree like hell and you fight like hell and all that kind of stuff but you never quite get there to hate your kid or dislike your kid right most of us at least i know there are people who hate their kids and dislike their kids but most of us don't but we have to try to move that firewall forward so that it has the same effect on the regular person that you're dealing with right the average American citizen, the average world citizen. You don't ever have to hate anybody, even if they disagree with you or get under your skin like Mike Sisek is getting under my skin right now when he says what he says. You just have to look and say, you know, we're kind of wired a little differently and we try to rewire each other and that we'll get there somewhere. But anyhow, none of the preaching. Let's go ahead and listen to Brother Ed Icorn and his opinion of health care. And he really... All, for all my super lefties, he really wants to solve the problem. He does see things through a capitalist eye. I think it's that's that is we're living through when one sees every aspect of society through that eye. We're living through that now. We have to convince others why that is the case. We have to convince others why we need bifurcated economies, meaning we need a part of the economy that follows the principles of not capitalism but free enterprise and the, fo- the portions of the s- community that is best done under more of a social state. But let's talk about that later. Anyway, welcome, Ed Icorn. Welcome to one more edition of Politics Done Right. I'm here with Ed Icorn, who is with Medlink Consulting Group and the author of Healing American Healthcare. This is our second iteration, and boy, do I want to hear 
what he has to say. Because you know what, folks? COVID-19 is here. And I think it makes the case for a lot of what we've been speaking about at Politics Done Right. I want to hear what somebody that doesn't have necessarily that take, but is just as interested in making sure everyone has affordable health care. Every single American has health care. Ed Icorn, how are you doing today, my friend? Hey, Berto, I'm feeling great, and it's great to be back with you again. Absolutely. So now, before we even get started, um, tell me a little bit about yourself to refresh our audience about your what you bring to this entire discussion. Sure. Um, I've been in healthcare uh, my whole career. I developed products and services and um, was a director of research for a kidney dialysis company some years ago. And I started my consulting practice uh, before Obamacare uh, was a legislative activity. And um, when I started reading um, Paul Ryan's bill in uh, 2017, at the beginning of the repeal and replace movement, I got very concerned because I didn't think the bill was really about health care. It was going to reduce taxes on the wealthy. It was going to reduce the federal deficit. It was going to reduce some benefits for Medicaid. It was going to make insurance less expensive for young, healthy Americans. And people over 60 would actually pay as much as six or 700 percent more for their insurance premiums. And uh, the CBO reported that four or five years after that would have become law, uh, about 20 million people would probably lose their insurance. So for me, this was a, a, a motivation. So my co-author, um, Dr. Mike Hutchinson, and I decided to do the research and write our book, Healing American Healthcare, uh, a plan to uh, provide coverage for everyone, but reduce the cost of healthcare by about a trillion dollars a year in our society. And with the coming pandemic that we are now in, uh, we started thinking about uh, the dynamics of health insurance uh, in the next Congress. Because as you remember, in the election for 2018, healthcare was the number one issue at that yeah. time. Yeah. And we are very strong supporters of universal health care. But we, uh, as we reported in our book, we think we must build on the system we have and uh, change the cost structure and still provide care for everyone. Um, and we think our plan would be more attractive uh, post-pandemic because, as you know, the United States uh, uh, government will probably spend between six and seven trillion dollars between now and the end of the fiscal year to, to help individuals, to prop up businesses. I mean, the Fed, I believe, just uh, committed to about uh, $2 trillion in uh, loan guarantees for uh, companies. Um, you know, it's been reported that the deficit this year is going to exceed $4 trillion, which is the largest deficit since World War II. And uh, the gross domestic product is going to shrink by between 6 and 8% uh, for the fiscal year that ends in September. So... Uh, we have uh, cross purposes here. The um, American people, we all want universal health care. This makes the most sense for our future and to take care of future epidemics so that people uh, can have direct access to care. But my concern is how does the government afford programs that will cost more federal and state dollars at a time when uh, we have uh, run up an enormous amount of additional debt? So. We believe a program that would reduce cost in our society, but would provide coverage for everyone is a better path at this time to get to universal health care. Uh, today, when you compare us with the uh, Organization for Economic and Cooperative Development of the UN, there are 36 nations, I believe, in that. Um, you know, we're in the bottom in, in uh, many categories, and especially in life expectancy. Uh, our life expectancy average is three years less than the average of the other nations in that group, um, even though we spend more on health care than, than they do. So um, we, we think our plan would address these kinds of issues to allow health care to be the right for everyone that it should be in a way that we could actually afford to have it occur and to build on systems we have by changing the operating envelope of those systems. Okay, when I when I read your system here, first of all, I mean, I remember from past uh, interviews with you. Uh, I don't think you were you you were really on board with something like single payer or Medicare for all. And I look at this section where you have employers have three options: self insurance, private insurance, or competitive public option. 
Mm-hmm. Um, it seems to me like ultimately uh, that will always res- that will ultimately devolve into everyone choosing competitive public option. Uh, yeah, I think that's possible. What I, what I'm um, essentially allowing the insurance industry uh, to do in the idea that I'm presenting here is to decide whether or not they can compete with a public option. And if they choose to compete with a public option and they provide a good service, they could retain some of their business. Uh, today, 90% of the private insurance company business is with employers. And they're going to want to keep that business. So if we have a hard and fast competition that's 30% less expensive than their average cost, they have to figure out whether or not they want to compete. It's, now, extremely, it's extremely possible that they won't. Yeah, but I, here, here's my question uh, for you, uh, Ed. Um, because... I the way you I, I think you're <laughs> I hate to put it this way but I think ultimately uh, you know if you are going to create a differential or whatever I think ultimately your stuff is going to turn into what you're asking to do will ultimately turn into some form of a single payer system just because of math and I I've, I've been trying to get people like let's say yourself or maybe Biden or others who uh take sort of a pragmatic middle of the ground approach, meaning I notice one of the things that you constantly say is uh, build upon the systems we already have. And I can understand that from the perspective of saying uh, it is the least disruptive and likely easier to get through. Mm -hmm. I think that is what you're saying. But if I am understanding this proper, it tells me that you may not be anathema to a Medicare for all at all. Well, um, I was opposed to some aspects of the way Medicare for All was proposed. You know, the aspects of it that were discussed by uh, the candidates uh, during the primaries are very attractive. But uh, when you read the bills, the, the way hospitals would be managed was not terribly attractive. And, the, and there was really, um, there may have been, but from our perspective, there wasn't much consideration of physician issues uh, in that. And what we're, we're saying is... Um, Let's deal with how we reduce the cost, some of which would be a part of that. Um, In the Medicare for all approach, there is an increase in bureaucracy on the idea of how hospitals are managed. And what we're saying is let's let the hospitals manage themselves uh, uh, against a billing standard that would be above Medicare in terms of of what the billing price would be. And it could be adjusted regionally as well. for example, there's a, a big movement over the last three years for hospitals to combine and to become groups of hospitals. And there are two things they could do. Um, they can lower their cost of operation, but they also uh, have more leverage power with insurance companies. And what we're suggesting is, it's fine to cooperate with each other and to grow into hospital groups, but we wanna take part of that leverage aspect with insurance uh, negotiation out of the mix and let them manage their businesses Um, to the best of their ability. And, you know, a plan like ours also would uh, be a great uh, boon to rural health care. You know, rural health care has been losing hospitals at the rate of two a month. And our plan would uh, help to uh, stabilize that change in the market that's very undesirable. Well, you know, um, when when, uh, we decided to do this interview, my, my concern, after I saw the information that you sent, you know, I'm, I constantly told myself, but how is he going to explain uh, paying for it? And I, I understand where you're coming from. I, I really do. Now, there's one other piece of your graph that uh, when, when I saw, uh, I looked at it and I said, okay, he has in there decreased medical-related bankruptcies in the U.S. by 50%. Mm-hmm. I would like to see that as 100%. In other words, that well, you so should not I... have medical bankruptcies, period. How could you, within your plan, actually move to that direction because I simply don't think healthcare should be something a family can go bankrupt about. No, I agree. In our graph, what we were talking about is uh, 62% of the bankruptcies are for uh, medical uh, reasons. And we wanted to reduce the bankruptcy rate nationally by 50%, which would be a vast majority of the bankruptcies that are medically related. If our plan uh, it was uh, accepted and moved forward, uh, medical bankruptcies would go away because everyone would have coverage. And, you know, there there would be some deductibles as there are in Medicare. Uh, and we would be uh, driving competition with insurance companies to compete with that or 
for self-insurance plans to compete with that. So the opportunity for uh, that unfortunate thing uh, for people to go bankrupt because of healthcare care would uh, fade away, we believe, as well. OK, now we're looking we're looking at this. Oops, I'm getting feedback from you, I think. Uh, we are looking at this from one from 50,000 feet. Let's start bringing it down a little bit more now. So how if we were to implement Ed Icorn's plan, where do we start? Well, I believe it uh, requires uh, an education of and um, a commitment uh, for the Congress to embrace a plan like this. Uh, because on one hand, you know, most progressives want universal health care. And uh, historically, on the right, people wanted to spend less on government. And in our plan, if all the employers have to provide health insurance, that would mean that a number of people who are currently on Medicaid but are fully employed would now get coverage through their employers. That would lower the cost of Medicaid substantially. Um, we also see our plan as an extension of Obamacare as uh, Biden is proposing it in his presidential election. Because in our plan, if everyone is going to get coverage through their insurance or through uh, our public option, uh, you don't need to have subsidies uh, for people to pay for insurance uh, based on their income because it's going to be coming to them through their employment or through the public option. So um, I think there are a number of ways the government could uh, reduce its expenditure level. I, I need to they'll, question they'll something there. The you, sure. said, you said there won't be subsidies. How's that the case? I mean, if you're working for a McDonald's and McDonald's is giving you insurance, more than likely you're not going to afford that insurance that, that uh, let's say, the, the manager would, would, would afford, right? If you're making $15 an hour or something like that. Uh, well, you... I, I, I think employers like McDonald's would embrace the public option. And the employee, uh, you know, very much like in the German plan, uh, would be asked to pay a small percentage of their salary. It would probably be um, the total cost of insurance would be about 15% of their salary and they'd have to pay up to 20% of the 15%. So we're talking about a very small fee uh, and a fee would grow based on income. Uh, you know, it's based on your income. That's so that is a sub that's a reverse subsidy, right? That, that, that's a, that, should be, that could be considered a subsidy, right? Well, I don't think so. Uh, because of the way it's collected. Um, you know, the subsidy is done in a different way and it comes out of the Medicaid budget. This isn't coming out of a government budget. This is, you know, uh, as the employee earns income, uh, a small portion of their income would be uh, their share of the insurance, just like it is in 60% uh, of the companies around the, uh, around the country. Right. Uh, so I guess I, I guess what I'm saying is still still if, if you're if you're a mom and pop store, right? You own a credit. Uh, you own a you sell cards, and mm -hmm. your your employees make ten dollars an hour. God forbid, but ten dollars an hour. Uh, they will never pay their share of what their actual insurance costs would be. Is that correct? Well, um, if we were to do this and we were to roll this out, and a small business would certainly be a part of it. Right. There would have to be um, an initial support structure for our businesses to convert to this sort of um, insurance compensation. And, you know, also for people who are um, Medicaid eligible um, today, there would still be coverage for them. But I think uh, there would have to be a rollout program that would allow small business to embrace how health care would be paid for. And it would eventually there would be, I believe, a uh, an inflationary component of this as the program rolled out because costs of certain things would have to increase a little bit to cover the insurance, but it wouldn't be a lot of money. It would be relatively small, I believe. But again, uh, my, my question again is who is, I mean, uh, or you're, you're saying there are no subsidies. So are you saying that that small company somehow is absorbing the entire policy? No, what I'm saying is, uh, if you were to um, go to this sort of program in our in our country, you would have to have a support structure for the mom and pop and small business to convert to this. And there would be a government cost during the period of rollout, perhaps over a five year period, where small companies would, would be involved in learning how to deal with the insurance cost in their businesses over a long period of time. It wouldn't be it's Thursday and we're going to start and now you have to pay for insurance in that small business 
end of the economy. Yeah. yeah. I am that part I think would be a bit concerning for me because I don't think a small business, uh, you know, and again, I love the idea that everybody should have insurance. I just don't see how it is a component of uh, certain small businesses. I know you talk about increased costs of, uh, let's say, the goods and services that that particular company sells. But, I mean, I, I think there are companies that are cer certainly so small that I, I am not sure. Again, I, I would have to see it in the paper. I, I think it would, we would always have to have where, however you define subsidy, that people get subsidized somehow, that they will never be able to afford what insurance costs okay. are. Well, you know, um, clearly... Uh, whether it's uh, the plan that we like or a different plan, there's not going to be a perfect plan. Right. And we're going to have to figure out how to deal with the uh, things that are uh, learned as we get more and more into the weeds of how to roll something out. Uh, but I, I think it is possible to do this in a way where the idea of subsidies are minimized. Certainly, um, you know, there wouldn't be the pressure on the uh, Medicaid system that we have now uh, for the subsidies of low-income people. It wouldn't come out that way. Um, I believe because of uh, the amount we spend on health care in the United States today, there's got to be a way for us to deal with uh, reducing the margins of insurance companies, uh, reducing the cost of pharmaceuticals, and uh, limiting the cost of bureaucracy. And, and in our study, that was an incredible number. I mean, 14% of what we spend on health care is bureaucracy. It's yeah. Usually about two hundred and fifty dollars for every man, woman, and child. Actually, it's more than that. Uh, it's oh, okay. much more than fourteen percent. It's more like if you really put all the intrinsics, it's more like twenty something percent. I mean, wow. there's a lot. There's a lot of fiddling. And Obamacare restricted them to eighteen percent. Previous to Obamacare, it used to be some some companies was upwards of thirty percent. It's amazing. Well, what that's the, that's the medical loss ratio, and in Obamacare. Um, it, it's 80 percent. And uh, in some of the legislation that's been proposed, uh, they want to increase that to 85 percent. Right. Uh, but but that's not just bureaucracy. That's uh, that's a number of things. That's marketing. That's uh, uh, intercompany you know, marketing charging. bureaucracy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm a capitalist, so margins are OK with me. But uh, <laughs> OK, yeah, you are a capitalist. But let me let me ask you something now that you've. I wasn't going to touch capitalism, <laughs> but now you, you went ahead and opened that door. Uh, let me ask you a foolish question here, because um, what, is, uh, what is the issue uh, with people who just believe that they have to have the private sector in every single facet of our lives? Example, uh, I think it's, I can, I can tell you mathematically speaking if, uh, if you are having to have an insurance company involved in something like healthcare, it will cost more. Uh, you would have to have an efficiency rate that is so much less by the government than pr the private sector provides that makes that of a lesser cost than what it would cost the private sector. In other words, I think, it, I think it's a myth that the private sector is more efficient than government in the aggregate, given that its shareholder value profit, et cetera, or really expenses on the system? Well, uh, when we talk about private insurance, we're usually talking about um, um, stock companies and, and their profit. But there is a segment of our insurance industry that's not for profit. Right. Green, uh, and, Blue Shields, Blue Cross, yeah. Right. And, and their uh, medical loss ratios are often 92, 93 percent. And if you converted the uh, medical loss ratio uh, to um, Medicare, it would probably be 95, 96%. Right. So they're not that far apart. And uh, when we were doing our research and thinking about the German model, uh, you know, in Germany, um, basically the insurance fees are collected through uh, um, income, but uh, each individual can choose between 114 or 15 um, nonprofit sickness funds, which are basically nonprofit insurance companies. Right. And, you know, I, I think it would be a, a, a change in the industry as to how they would approach trying to be uh, as uh, efficient in, as the government is. And, you know, companies would, would, you know, choice is an important part of our health Did you just hear what you said, uh, Ed? I think it's important what you just said. Right. I right. think they could be just as efficient as the government. That's what you just said, which you're correct. 
You're absolutely Good. correct. So my question to you then is, why not just let it be the government? I know that you're a capitalist, <laughs> but why not let it just be the government? If, if we know that math would... S- Look, I, 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 love that. I love what you've done, really, because I think from a pragmatic point of view, uh, it is more likely in the short to midterm that this happens. And when you, when you profess as, I am a capitalist... It also, <laughs> you know, but, well, it also I'm fits a that domain. But, no. What's that? I'm a compassionate capitalist. No, no, I know. L- look, let me tell you, I don't have a problem with capitalism as it relates to making a mug, making a phone, or any one of these things. I do have a problem with it in healthcare. I don't think that we need to um, have all of this in healthcare. I think what Ed Icorn is doing is an important step. I honestly do think. It's an important step because people don't like large gradients. You're an engineer, if I remember correctly, right? Both of us are engineers. So people don't like large gradients. Now, uh, (laughs) you know, but so, I mean, I think of it as a good stopgap measure. But I would wish I could get into maybe all of our heads that for healthcare at least, let's try to use the most efficient method. And for everything else, let Ed Icorn and his capitalism reign. Well, you know, I want to just share with you, and you may have seen the study, uh, 538.com did a study uh, late in the primary season, and uh, they just uh, surveyed Democrats in this particular study. And uh, they found that 77% of the respondents were in favor of Medicare for all. Mm -hmm. 88% of the same group wanted to keep their own health insurance. Yeah. So uh, part of what's important is the choice factor. And Americans want choice, even if they make that choice for whatever coverage they want through their right. employer. So um, if we can build choice into the system in a way that um, allows the government to be very competitive and essentially uh, morphs or changes the insurance industry, I'm OK with that. Uh, but part of what we, we think is important to begin with is employers need to be self-insured by private insurance or choose the public option. And we would be making a tremendous economic incentive for them to consider the public option for their employees. And, you know, I think if you uh, set up a system that uh, allows for competition and creativity, um, you will get a a better outcome. And the creativity may be in the public option or it may be in the private option. Uh, I spent a lot of my career making medical devices and building medical services and uh, creativity in doing those things is really important to get to the right answer. And uh, if we can keep that in the system, uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, it could be a government system or it could be a private system or a combination thereof. Yeah, well, Ed, uh, let me let me tell you, first of all, I, I, I haven't read your book. I've read pieces of your book when we did it the first time. And mm-hmm. I was, in fact, very impressed with what you wrote within the constraints of capitalism, that is. And I think the amount of work that you put into this, uh, I wish Washington would listen to it because if uh, those of us who are fighting like hell for Medicare for all are unsuccessful, the person that I would want to go to is at ICORN because uh, that is a plan. That would be my second choice of plan because I actually believe it would morph into what we want just at a slower pace. That's very possible. So, Ed Icorn, thank you so kindly for again presenting to us a great piece of work. I'll put your book in the post because I think people ought to be able to read and follow all these different options that, that's put out there. So I thank you again for being on Politics Done Right. Well, it was great to see you again, uh, Egberto, and I wish you all the best as we move forward in the future. Thank you, Ed. I really like Ed. 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 Uh, there are a lot of people doing good things. People have different ideological swings, etc. But if you are one that sees uh, that you want to do good for humanity, you're on my team. You're on my team. If anybody wants to call, I'll take call six four six seven one six five eight one two. Again, that number is six four six seven one six five eight one two. If you want to call, I got through just in time that I can actually get some talk to some of my brothers and sisters here on the chat. So let's go. 
Well, of course, I, er, I started earlier by saying, welcome aboard. Susan and Bruce are online. Bruce Davis, hi, brother, from Portland, Oregon. My brother, Bruce Davis, I hope you're still here, but thank you so kindly. Norman Reynolds, my, br my, my, Caribe, mi hermano del Caribe. Y que está aprendiendo español también. I hope you understood that, Norman. You're taking Spanish. You got to learn that, brother. So um, if you understood what I said, tell me in the chat room. All right, let's see. Michael Rudnan, let's see these idea, how these ideas compare. Medicare for All would save $450 billion annually while preventing 68,000 deaths. It's even deeper than that, brother Rudnan. Also, it means everybody. It costs less and everybody is insured. And the reason it costs less is simple. This thing that we learned in school, what was it called again? Oh, I forgot. Math. Math. Arithmetica. Michael Cisak. The only reason I don't share this is to provide people a laugh at the insanity here. Don't worry. For those of you who are new to the chat room or new to Politics Done Right, Mike Cisak gives me a hard time all the time. I love him. He loves me. Don't let him fool you, okay? All right. Michael Rudnan, George Carlin. Boy, these guys. I remember that. Uh, I'm not going to read it out, but I remember that. And check out the one that I have at my website. I do a scan on George Carlin on EgbertoWillies.com. Check it out. Oh, by the way, folks, if you're listening to me, please remember, go to my, tweet, my Twitter and go ahead and uh, follow Egberto Willis on Twitter. Go to, uh, to, to YouTube. Go to YouTube.com slash Egberto Willis. And go ahead and follow me uh, or what? subscribe on YouTube on this channel. If you're here on my Facebook channel, don't just come to the Facebook channel. Like the Facebook channel. Please do. Miguel Cisak. Let's see what else. So we need to have everyone lose their life because that's protecting them? No, senor. Don't, don't believe the right-wing stuff. We'll have to talk about that another time because I only have 12 minutes. All right, let's go. Egberto, what economic system then do you recommend? If you claim you to want a private marketplace, then government should open things up. I want a private marketplace, but health, ta I mean, health takes a pre pre is preeminent over anything. Mike, listen. Listen to me and listen to me well. If you could, if you could never sneeze on me, and if... Other people who go to your place of business ultimately won't sneeze on me or transmit corona to me involuntarily. I would say, laissez-faire, do as you please. But we're in a society that are closed in. And by me looking at your irresponsible, you have the right to be irresponsible. You have that right to be irresponsible. I also have the right to be responsible. In a society where we all pay taxes, we come to agreements. And that agreement is for now, shut the darn thing down because I don't want you killing me, whether voluntarily or involuntarily. So that's the reason why, sir. Okay, Michael Runnin, President Trump ran for president of the United States on two propositions. I alone can fix it, which he proved false, and I'm going to make America great again. He made America a fool again. All right? Uh, Avanj <laughs> AVQ, damn. Michael Caesar, the record contradicts Steve's opinion. No, sir. We have uh, we are approaching a hundred thousand people dead. We're at seventy-three thousand people dead so far. That would not have happened if the if the president had taken things seriously. Not about shutting down uh, China. That is that was minimal. Tracing, contact tracing, isolating in every time somebody came up with it. If he had done his job instead of being scared that the Wall Street would crash. Americans would not have the death toll that we have. Your president, our president, failed. He failed miserably. And that one cannot see that this is a guy lacking not only of intellect, but lacking of a soul, lacking of care for even you, Mr. CSAC. Do you really think he cares about your farm? Think about how the farm bill was written, Mr. CSAC. I am trying to save your butt on your farm, sir. Okay, my brother Cisek, let's go to Daniel Gohin. We need to open up this country up now, and we cannot sit quietly and wait, wait for the government to open things up. We have to demand to open the country back up again. Okay, Daniel. So, well, what do you intend to do if, the, if those of us who demand 
that you not infect us, prevent you from infecting us. Blow the, sh blow the stuff up? I don't think so. Okay, politics done right with Egberto. Daniel going, we will talk after Ed. Oh, that's me talking to you. <laughs> All right. Mike, last, from last December before the pandemic, according to the research, U.S. life expectancy declined for three consecutive years. Yes, and you know, where, you know what is funny about it? And I shouldn't say funny. It's sad. Uh, because there was a time in this country where it was the, the people who were considered the underclass that all this decline and the, the misery was happening to. But it's changing. And I spoke about this several years ago, all before I was into full-time activism. I always said that our economic system eats and eats and eats and extracts and extracts. And only the chosen are built up and then the guardians of the gate keep the rest, right? But, but, it grows at such a pace that it starts to eat what I call its own. And I've been talking about uniting Appalachia, the ghettos and the barrios for a long time. And the reason why, because... These guys created separation so that they could screw everyone at large, but some always thought, at least I'm not them. But that is going away because they now have to come for you. And, you know, nobody sits down and talk about this in, in the boardrooms. This is what, these are the people we're going to get now or whatever. It happens. The path is laid out and it happens. Nobody has to go into a boardroom and have some kind of a talk about it. Scott Tillinsley. Aren't criticisms of me Medicare for all based on speculations about specifics? It might be a bit like HR 30, I have to remember that bill, 1384 would be subject to revision by committee. Thank you, Scott. You're absolutely right, my brother. Bruce, that will be interesting reading. The criteria of developed countries might have something to do with that. It's a wicked statistic to derive. Yes. Uh, let's see, PNHP, I actually interviewed the president of PNHP about four or five years ago, Michael. That's a great, great, great organization of doctors who want to make change. Rose Williams says, replying to Daniel, based on what? Norman Reynolds, why is insurance hooked to employment? It, it has historical reasons. Uh, when people couldn't get payment from companies, they made the deal, okay, since you're not going to pay me, at least insure me. It was a it was a it was a deal created from the devil or with the devil. It made no sense. It never ever made sense that you put your health care in the hands of a corporation because a corporation's is temporary. Well, a lot of people in the olden days used to stay with a corporation forever. Now they don't, and now corporations don't even want to give you health care. So Norman, you're you're hitting the nail on the head. You should not have. Uh, your insurance attached to corporations. Lawrence Sims. Welcome aboard, Lawrence. I don't know if I told you hi. Yep, unless the Supreme Court do, uh, does away with it, Con Obamacare is not going away. And yeah, but they're crippling it. Look at what they did. They took out the individual mandate. The individual mandate put that thing at risk. Why? Even if it doesn't have a risk from the government, I mean, from the Supreme Court, it has risk from just its financing. Because if people don't buy insurance and they're not, there's no penalty to recover some of that, it means it costs everybody else more. Rumor has it that it's going up 40% in November. Why? Coronavirus. That is why we need to have a new paradigm. And we're, uh, let's see. No, I'm not going to have time to talk about the new paradigm. Maybe I'll have a, sh a show completely on new paradigm. Uh, replying to Norman Reynolds, 160 million Americans get their health care from employer. Terrible, terrible, terrible. Rose Williams, the attachment to employment is one of the worst aspects of our current system. Clap, 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 Rose Williams, as usual, you show, you show your ingenuity. Uh, Norman, that goes back to FDR. Yes, thank you for telling him, CSAC. Uh, wage and price control, World War II control inflation due to so, so employers paid for health insurance of employees. Yes, that, that's true, that's true. Uh, let's see, Ro huge corporations basically can hold their employees hostage. Perfecto mundo, while a new and small business can't compete from the start. Exactly right, Rose Williams. Michael Cisak, we should go to cash-only doctors. <sighs> Do away with the administrative costs and along with third parties approval. You know, I imagine, Mike, you're a very healthy guy and your wife is probably healthy and your kids are probably healthy. 
God forbid any one of you got a disease that runs into the hundreds of thousands. More than likely, I think I've spoken to you before where you may believe in catastrophic insurance, which costs a lot less. But still, it has other bad options with it. So I, I won't go there. Egberto, private companies are efficient at extracting profits from the systems. The problem comes when those systems are responsible for life and Exactly right, uh, Rudnan. And, and that is what we have to try to put into people's. We have to get people the right kind of empathy so that they understand that the private sector isn't efficient either. This is just a myth. Thank you. Uh, who said that? Uh, Rose Williams. You're absolutely right, Rose. Choice, that isn't a choice. What I tell people about insurance choices, right? It's a lie. If, if you're enslaved by insurance company, put it this way. My ancestors were slaves somewhere, whether in the Caribbean, Latin America, or America. Okay? If there was master number one, big house number one, master number two, big house number two, master number three, big house number three, and you say, Egberto, at least you have choices. What kind of choice is that? Which master I want is the same thing with insurance. Consider insurance your master because they are your master. They determine what, what drugs you're going to take, what doctors you have the ability to see, how much you're, they're going to pay of it. They are a slave master. Unfortunately, you are the slave. That is the deal you make. They decide your health care, not government. Everybody else, uh, we don't want government tell us. Government is saying we're going to pay for it and you choose your, your doctors, etc., these guys say, you are going to choose these doctors in this network if you decide to go with us. So if you go with this master, you get this. If you go with that master, you get that. Al Road, welcome aboard, Al Road. Americans don't a private insurance system they, that doesn't care about people and extracts wealth, leaving people homeless, unemployed. Love you, Al Road. You're absolutely perfecto mundo correct. CSAC, your personal experience isn't a measure of a larger system. But, you know, CSAC hasn't seen anything yet. One of these days, he will. And when he does, you know, he will be back with us. He will be back clamoring for what we are requesting, what we are asking for. CSAC is not a bad guy at all. I don't want people to go back and nobody in this room is, are bad. We just have to try to work with them. When I worked in industry, I was shocked by all the waste and craziness when I was younger, I used to work for a number of... Oh, I'm running out of time. Let me do one real quick one. Life expectancy number is not entirely a fault of our healthcare system. That's true. It's also part of personal uh, behavior. But again, which personal behavior do you want to hit up on and which one do you want to forgive? You know, it's all... We're all in this together. Rose Williams, let's see. Let me go to somebody I haven't gotten to. Michael Rudnan. All right, folks. I got to get out of here because I got to tell you guys, first of all, uh, please, 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 uh, those of you who are listening to me right now, uh, consider becoming members of Politics Done Right. First of all, go to our store. Go to our store, store.politicsdoneright.com. That is store.politicsdoneright.com. Go ahead and look on the screen and get a t-shirt, get a mug. You can also get, as I see it, Class Warfare. The only resort to right-wing doom. You learn everything you need to know about our economy and the failures of all that good stuff. The good stuff. I mean, it, it's, it's really good. But what we would really like to ask you to do is become subscribers. Subscribe by going to where? Just go to patreon.com slash politics done right. Again, that is p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash politics done right. You can also uh, contribute or subscribe as well at uh, paypal.me slash politics done right again that is paypal.me slash politics done right it somehow seemed like i didn't get those in there so let me do this again uh you can go to uh what is no uh oh, i guess we're having a few problems some few issues right here anyhow folks um just go to patreon.com slash politics done right p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash politics done right my name is Egberto Willis. This is Politics Done Right. And you know how I end this, baby. I am what? Out! I'm Egberto Willis, host of Politics Done Right, an independent news program. I post several news videos of interest every day. I ask you so kindly to subscribe to my channel. And please, leave me some comments. Thank you very much.